Spoilers for Scooby-Doo and the Halloween franchise ahead. Happy Halloween, everybody! Welcome to Creepy Puppets Presents. I'm your puppeteer, Tommy, and thank you for attending the conclusion of my first ever Scooby-Doo month. If you're new to my channel, I primarily talk about philosophical issues, increasingly using popular media as jumping off points. Today we're talking about the deepest Scooby-Doo lore for hardcore fans, Scooby-Doo continuity. See, as a 53-year-old franchise, Scooby-Doo has many, many entries, and they frequently contradict each other. From Mystery Incorporated's hometown, to how old the gang is when certain events occur, and in an especially stark example that I'm rather fond of, Dracula, yes, real Dracula, has appeared four times in the franchise history, not including cameos in Goblin King, and they are in the new Scooby-Doo show, the new Scooby-Doo Mysteries, Cool School and The Reluctant Werewolf. And the thing is that every one of these Draculi is a completely different character, and neither the gang nor Dracula himself remember these prior meetings. Now, this could be attributed to Scooby-Doo being a kid show and the writers not really caring, but fittingly for a franchise that frequently crosses over with DC, the answer with the most textual evidence is Scooby-Doo makes use of a comic book continuity. So part one, what is comic book continuity? So let's say you have to write a serialized story once a week. On its own, maybe that's not too hard. Now keep that up for 80 years. Much less easy. Even though it feels like 80 years, it's being reported that One Piece is entering its final arc after only 25 years. So you're a writer on an 80 year old comic book. Your character has been punching the same clown for decades, your main hero should be on the verge of retirement, and his faithful manservant should be long dead from old age. You've got a couple options. You can do a hard reboot, retell the origin story anew, or you could do a soft reboot in which all the basic details are preserved, but you don't really pay that much attention to previous continuity. And when the hardcore fans complain, suggest maybe that the story takes place in an alternate parallel universe. Maybe you do a Crisis on Infinite Earth style crossover. So suppose you pick up like a random Batman comic, right? Whatever version of Batman this is, his parents probably got shot. But unless explicitly referenced in that series, there's no guarantee a given scene of the Waynes getting turned into Swiss cheese is the version that happened to this specific iteration of Batman. That's the logic of comic book continuity. So for a more Scooby-centric example, in Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo, Red Herring has a cameo as an adult, and Pup Name Scooby-Doo is explicitly name-dropped. So we can assume events similar to the events of A Pup Named Scooby-Doo happened in the same universe as Happy Halloween. But it can't be the same events we saw in Pup, because Happy Halloween takes place in the gang's hometown of Crystal Cove, not Coolsville, which was their hometown in Pup. The idea that Scooby-Doo uses comic book continuity is made stronger by the end of Mystery Incorporated, where we explicitly get introduced to the idea of a Scooby-Doo multiverse. There are multiple Scooby gangs across multiple parallel timelines, having undergone similar, but not identical, adventures. But the question is, which adventures go with which version of the Scooby gang? For this, we need to look at textual evidence. Part 2. Textual evidence. Textual evidence refers to specific examples from source material to demonstrate a point. So for example, if you saw my previous video where I talked about lesbian Velma, I noted there was an absence of textual evidence for that conclusion prior to Trick or Treat. So there were no examples in prior Scooby-Doo media of lesbian Velma. All the evidence in support of lesbian Velma came from outside of the show, from the fact that uh, Velma was based on the famous lesbian activist Sheila James Poole. To examine how textual evidence can help us sort continuity, let's take a short detour into another franchise with completely insane continuity, Halloween. Officially, there are five continuities in the Halloween franchise. Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, where the Michael Myers movies are completely fictional within that universe. The second official continuity, which is usually called the Thorn continuity, has 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. The H2O continuity, which is 1, 2, H2O, and 8. Then you have the Rob Zombie continuity, movies 9 through 10. And then this new Danny McBride continuity that I'm calling it, uh, the original, and 11, 12, and 13. Halloween 1978, Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, Halloween Dies. Even Dies Tonight. God, that was stupid. Uh, 
However, the textual evidence supports a sixth continuity, which is Halloween 1 through 8, excluding Season of the Witch, what I'm going to call the big continuity. See, at the end of Halloween 2, Michael Myers gets his eyes shot out and is burned alive. How could Michael survive? Well, Halloween 4, 5, and 6, collectively known as the Thorn Trilogy, explains that Michael Myers is the victim of the Thorn Curse, an ancient Celtic curse that compels its bearer to kill their family members on Halloween as a sacrifice. But while doing that, it, the curse also grants the victim super strength and super healing. This is how Michael Myers can still be alive and a threat after the end of Halloween 2. These movies also introduce the concept that Laurie Strode died off screen between Halloween 2 and Halloween 4. But the Thorn trilogy, especially Halloween 6, were very unpopular, so Halloween H2O despite being written as a sequel to 6, is officially only a sequel to 2. Here's the thing, H2O can't possibly be a sequel to 2, because without the Thorn Curse, how could Michael Myers have survived being burned alive and regrown his eyes? Also, H2O claims that Laurie faked her death, but you only need to write that in if Halloween 4 was canon. As purely a sequel to 2, you could just cut that out. Finally, there's a shot in the opening montage of H2O which has very explicitly the bloody scissors from Halloween 4. So, so this idea that 7 could be a direct sequel to 2 just doesn't make any sense. So these 7 films also tell a complete narrative from beginning to end. After the Thorn Cult is destroyed at the end of Halloween 6, Michael is finally free of the Curse of Thorn. That's why he doesn't try to kill his son at the end of 6 or his nephew at the end of H2O. He wants to kill Lori purely to put an end to their personal sibling rivalry. And when he succeeds in killing Lori at the beginning of Halloween Resurrection, Michael Myers does done. He just wants to retire and he's ready to put down the knife. But unfortunately for him, Buster Rhymes decides to film a reality show in his house. The tragedy of Michael Myers is that he will never be able to rest. Cutting out Halloween 2 from the reboot sidesteps the how did he survive without magic plot hole, but it creates a brand new one. Why would anyone take Michael seriously as a villain? So hopefully with this side rant into Halloween, I've convinced you of the utility of textual evidence as the basis for sorting out continuity. I really love the Halloween franchise. Yes, even Resurrection, and yes, I do like Buster Rhymes. As someone who doesn't like hip-hop, I enjoy his, his uh, funk and soul influences. But... Anyway, let's get back to Scooby-Doo with Part 3, the series in the Scooby-Doo canon and proposed continuities. So, uh, before we can sort out Scooby-Doo series by continuity, we should probably say something about what those series are. Most people are familiar about Where Are You, and probably familiar about what's new Scooby-Doo and Zombie Island, but are kind of fuzzy about what happened in the middle. So after Where Are You, we got the new Scooby movies, those were the crazy crossover ones, then followed by the Scooby-Doo show, then we have the Scrappy series, and that's where things start to get fuzzy about one series ending and the next one beginning. There's Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, the Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show, the new Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show, and the new Scooby-Doo mysteries. And the new Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show is where Daphne is reintroduced to the cast, which continues into the new Scooby-Doo mysteries. Though I've always been in the habit of lumping that season where Daphne joins in the, the new show in with new mysteries. Anyway, after all of that nonsense, we get 13 Ghosts, which was cancelled. A few years later, we got Pup of Scooby-Doo, which ended in 91. And we wouldn't get a new Scooby-Doo show for another 11 years until 2002. Then we got Get a Clue, which I won't be covering, followed by Mystery Incorporated, arguably the best-rated Scooby-Doo series, followed by the very controversial Be Cool, which also got cancelled, followed ultimately by Guess Who, which just wrapped. There have been a few popular YouTube videos on Scooby-Doo continuities, most notably Film Theories. So Film Theory argues for three continuities, a virtual world continuity based on cyber chase, a monsters are real continuity, and a monsters are bad guys in mass continuity. The problem with this, as I went through in my video on Scooby-Doo skepticism, is that monsters have been real in almost every incarnation of Scooby-Doo. The YouTuber Hyperfly also supports a two-timeline theory based on Scrappy's existence, but I ultimately think it's not very helpful either. 
as two continuities don't seem like enough continuities to account for all the variety in Scooby-Doo. No, I think there are easily eight or more continuities in Scooby-Doo, so let's get into that. Part 4, the best continuity based on textual evidence. So having re all of Scooby-Doo, I think textual evidence best supports at least 11 continuities, but most of those are one-offs. So, so there's the original continuity, which is everything from Where Are You to 13 Ghosts, with some scrappy shorts and some of the Superstar 10 movies, remember that's The Luck and Werewolf, Blue Brothers, and Ghoul School, being of dubious canon uh, to this series. These movies share a common art style uh, and have consistent character arcs, specifically Daphne going from damsel in distress to action heroine, and it tells a consistent story of our characters aging from teenagers debunking real estate schemes to adults saving the world from demons. My second continuity are the Moog films, Zombie Island, which is Ghost, Alien, Invaders, and Cyber Chase, but this is clearly an alternate continuity version of the new Scooby-Doo mysteries, with adult Daphne as a reporter reuniting the gang to encounter real monsters. The Moog films then directly inspired the What's New continuity, which I believe includes a pup named Scooby-Doo, then What's New Scooby-Doo the series, and all of the What's New Scooby-Doo era films from Legend of the Vampire through Samurai. Again, consistent art style and characters, not just the gang, but also the Hex Girls, and we get a flashback to when the gang were kids done in the same art style as Puck and Scooby-Doo. Also, the extreme versions of Daphne and Fred that appear in Puck and Scooby-Doo could have plausibly mellowed out and aged up into these characters. Then, I think 4, 5, and 6, a whole bunch of, of one-offs. So, uh, Get a Clue, Be Cool, and the Mystery Incorporated series, which all have, again, one-off art style, animation, and characterization. Then, for another long continuity, I have as continuity 7, the Crystal Cove movies. Every movie and special between Abracadabra Doo and Sorting Scoob. These movies are united by the gang being from Crystal Cove and having personalities that are inspired by the uh, Mystery Incorporated version, though uh, also taking influence from the What's New version. Uh, but this, this movie continuity is also pretty clearly an alternate continuity from Mystery Incorporated, as in Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo, we see when we're back in Crystal Cove that it's not the town from the Cosmic Reboot sign, not Crystal Cove, the happiest place on Earth, but it still has the Crystal Cove, the hauntedest place on Earth, uh, so it can't be a post-reboot Crystal Cove. Then, I think another short continuity that we've already talked a bit about, which is Guess Who, and the new Trick or Treat movie, which is already done in the same art style and characterization, and you can watch my review of Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo for my thoughts on that. Then we have the theatrical live-action films, and then the TV live-action films, and then wrapping it up for the 11th one is the one-off live-action Daphne Velma film. I know we will be getting more continuities in the future with Kaling's Velma, but I don't want to watch it. Uh, and then another continuity with a show for preschoolers, I believe. But for right now, I think we can make a case for these 11 continuities. But you've probably read the title of this video and are wondering, hey, you promised AI. Where is the AI? So, part five, the AI. So by AI, I'm primarily talking about machine learning. There are two uh, broadly uh, different kinds of machine learning. So there's supervised and unsupervised. Supervised machine learning gives the computer a training data set with correctly classified objects and associated variables. The computer then classifies new objects based on those associated variables. A simple linear regression algorithm is a, a very basic form of supervised machine learning. Unsupervised machine learning asks the computer to sort the objects how the computer sees them. So, uh, k-means clustering algorithms tell you the most parsimonious number of categories to sort objects into, and then it sorts them into however many categories you specify. If you saw my video on transmedicalism, we used this technique to demonstrate that there really are just two sexes. We can also use hierarchical clustering to build a family tree of object categories. Finally, Ordination is a related technique that groups objects by similarity. Of course, it doesn't make an explicit call on their categorization. Um, for my job, I do it an awful lot. Like, half my time is spent doing ordination. So, 
my plan is to use these techniques to sort all of the Scooby-Doo series into continuities. But before we do that, we need to talk about some variables and what continuities we're including. So, part six, the variables. As promised, we're not going to appeal to a our monster is real as a variable. Primarily, I'm focusing on art style, the gang's ages, the gang's hometown, the Poolsville, Crystal Cove, or other. And actually, apparently, they were intended to be from Laguna Beach. Which version of the Hex Girls, the ones from Witch's Ghost, or the ones from Mr. Incorporated show up? Which version of Vincent Van Gogh shows up? Which version of Daphne and Fred's personalities are used? Velma's race and sexuality, and of course which version of the real Dracula shows up. I'm going to leave out a few entries from my analysis. Um, so Scooby-Doo, where it's like wraparound segments or anthologies, so I'm thinking here of Scooby-Doo Goes Hollywood and Arabian Nights, and I'm going to drop Get a Clue, and I'm going to drop Daphne and Velma because those are clear one-offs, and also because I, I really don't like them anyway. So having set up our variables and our objects, let's get to the results. Part 7. Results. So, let's start with ordination. So, I've tagged each entry in the franchise as being before or after the reboot, with Zombie Island being the first entry in the reboot. Note that all of the after-reboot properties not only form a distinct cluster from the before-reboot properties, but they're also more closely clustered together than the series before the reboot, with a pup named Scooby-Doo being the closest pre-reboot series near the after-reboot cluster. This suggests to me that we can sort the series into two broad meta-categories, with Pup as a transition between the two. Ideas created in newer series are more likely to be picked up by subsequent series, which could be used to explain the tightness of the cluster. I did some subsequent analysis in the proprietary software package PC Word, and found the most important variables affecting the clustering were art style, the gang's hometown, and Fred's personality. Next, let's take a look at K-Means clustering. The elbow plot recommends either five or eight continuities as the most parsimonious. So let's start with five continuities. Continuity one clusters What's New Scooby-Doo with the Moog films, which is fair, I suppose. Continuity 5 pretty closely maps onto what we've been calling the original continuity, but Continuity 2 and Continuity 4 seem more or less random, and Continuity 3 seems to exist almost in a miscellaneous bin. So I decided to increase the number of continuities from 5 to 8 and see if that does any better. So Continuity 1 combines Pup, Be Cool, the later What's New era movies, and the theatrical live-action films together, while What's New itself clusters with the Mook films again, and some early What's New movies. Continuity 7 preserves the original continuity, with the Blue Brothers as a member, while the other two Superstar 10 movies have been exiled to Continuity 2. Guess Who and Trick or Treat are clustered together, as are the Crystal Cove movies, but are separated from Mystery Incorporated. Finally, the TV live-action Scooby-Doo movies are together with Scoob in Continuity 8. Overall, eight continuities mapped the closest onto what I projected before the analysis, the major deviation being the clustering of what's new, the series, with the Moog films, rather than with the movies that are approximately similar to it. Finally, let's take a look at the hierarchical clustering model, and see if we can find a family tree of Scooby-Doo series, as it were. Okay, so I think this one might need a little work, as the only pattern I can discern is that uh, series coming after Mystery Incorporated appear sort of in that large cluster on the right-hand side of the graph. Part 8, Conclusions. It's difficult to keep a series fresh after five decades without breaking continuity or rebooting, Scooby-Doo, as an old franchise that never really cared that much about continuity in the first place, has experienced several reboots and continuities. Still, over this multiverse of stories, we have some consistencies. The gang have been friends, usually since before high school. They solved their classic mysteries in high school, stayed together through college, then went their separate ways as adults, until Daphne's career as a reporter brought the gang back together to save the world from real monsters. Scooby continuities can be split into two broad continuity clusters, before Zombie Island and after Zombie Island, 
which just cements how important Zombie Island is to this franchise. A pup named Scooby-Doo acts as a kind of transition between the two states. Properties before Zombie Island form a neat original continuity with each other, excluding two of the Superstar 10 films. It's just unclear which two. Personally, I think Cool School has the best case for being included in the original continuity. Properties after Zombie Island have been more consistent in their use of mythology and can also be further subdivided into Before and After Mystery Incorporated, especially the Crystal Cove movies and the Guess Who slash Trick or Treat continuity. Before Mysteries Incorporated, the Mook films and the What's New series and movies form two very closely related continuities that the algorithm can't even really parse out the difference between. And that, dear friends, takes us to the end of my first Scooby-Doo month. It's been fun. I actually have at least two more Scooby-Doo videos I want to make, but I think I'll take a little break from that, at least for November. Um, we'll have to talk about the midterm elections after that happens, and I do want to talk also about it being 60 years of James Bond. But until we get to those properties, happy Halloween, my friends. <laughs>